And I remember her saying like, back at that time, like when she moved over here, like she was the only black woman in her area. Like, okay, like I was taking like a four or five year old, like Jamaica, Cuba, like to different places, right? So straight away, like people being, being nice to me from different cultures and different color of the skin and stuff like that, then, it made, probably made me more open-minded when I was like a little bit of a chubby kid. I wasn't very athletic. I, wasn't, I think I was angry at like the way that I felt about myself. Like instead of brushing off comments and stuff, I took them personally, but almost, as, I, as I started seeing results, I realized that I actually liked the process. Everyone who spoke to us then was all personal training and like jobs like that are just for people that can't do uni quotes. We're just trying to be Instagrammable because I think if it looks the part, like it's quite easy to get clients to come in there at least once and then hopefully your coaching standards are good enough to keep them. He was like, if you come down to London, I might be able to get you on Love Island. My guest today is an entrepreneur, personal trainer and social media influencer from Newcastle. You might know him from his appearance on Love Island in 2018, but he's since established his own gym, clothing line, and online coaching academy. Welcome, Adam Collard. Yes, mate. Glad to be on. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? Um, yeah, I'm all good, mate. I'm all good. So, so, uh, it's always a funny one when I hear the intros. It's like the most interesting part for me because everyone has a different one. I've probably done quite a few of these podcasts by now, but... Uh, it's funny having one from someone that actually knows us as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, we may as well we may as well get the elephant out. Uh, uh, what was it? The elephant in the room or whatever. We'll talk about that. Is me and Adam know each other for um, a decade now, which seems quite surreal that it's that long since we're both yeah. quite young, <laughs> um, and have been really good friends for the majority of that time. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I started the podcast. To be fair, we we've talked about this beforehand, and we've had many in-depth conversations uh, over the years so I thought may as well um, start a podcast you know what I mean <laughs> this is probably the first thing that you're the front man in <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like exactly everything it's always been you helping me now you definitely when I started YouTube and I started like my first ever personal training advertising videos you were you were a big help with that so it, it's quite funny she was on the other foot for one don't yeah. get nervous <laughs> <laughs> it's good I'm getting there I'm getting there I'm choking up um but as I do in all the podcasts, what we're going to do is start right at the beginning, trip down memory lane, what you were like uh, as a kid growing up. This could be any age range, That, but what are your fondest memories of, of your childhood? Um, my childhood was pretty insane um, in the sense of like, I was so lucky and I know everyone says that and it's a bit cliche, but like I... I had a lot of opportunities from a young age from the sense of like, my mom and dad were pretty hard working, both self-employed, both driven, but like in the, not in the, they took me everywhere and anywhere around the world, um, showed us everything, really supportive, took us into any sports that I could possibly do, even though I wasn't the most athletic kid when I was a kid, but uh, like, yeah, really, really lucky, like blessed in the sense of like went on holiday absolutely everywhere, probably like over five times a year, the most amazing places, um, from such a young age and being like a really close knit sort of family. Um, and yeah, the parents were always there supporting us and stuff like that. Really caring family, quite a close, cl close knit family, but like at the same time, like pretty strict in the sense of like going to school and putting me in more, more advanced situations than I was. So like, I used to spend quite a lot of time as a kid, like going to like business meetings and stuff like that, which is absolutely ridiculous. But, um, yeah, like being around an environment where it was very business oriented from a young age. Which uh, which a lot of Indians can sort of um, relate to, which is mainly this audience so far. And the the culture aspect, because it is a culture cast podcast that I'm going to sort of dive into with you, is that not many people know about your grandma, your nin? Yeah, yeah, not a lot of people know. So like the tattoo that people always ask about, it actually is there. Um, my nin was a very influential character in my life. Um, so obviously grandma um, has passed away now, but she was like the center point of the family on my dad's side and it's a massive family. And she was the only sort of, she was the only religious 
um, impression that I had in my whole childhood, but like not in the sense of like, like putting it on me and forcing me into being like religious or anything like that. Just using like, using almost who she would have been like 85 now, maybe something like that, but using a quite modern approach to just take the morals out of like Christianity and stuff like that and just put them into my life aspect, whether it be like hard work, whether it be like doing something for other people, like trying to be kind, trying to help people, like different sort of stuff. But she was like the forefront of like my sort of, she told me a lot about like the culture of like her growing up and how hard it was for her coming into like this now like modern age sort of like England because she came from Portugal at a young age um, and definitely like that would make me more open-minded as an individual when it comes to like loads of different things like obviously there's a the Black Lives Matters and stuff like that and loads of different things like she I don't even know where I'm going with this to be honest she just taught me a lot of morals so you said that like she, she sort of stripped away the Christianity aspect and gave you the morals clean cut and as obviously I know it's it, it, and maybe this is the reason why it's because she was grown uh, growing up in like a really strict sort of um monastery or nunnery How, what was it yeah so uh she she grew up in a monastery she it was like back there I she used to tell a story after story and this was it's mad for me listening to it but when I was a kid, she used to tell us this one all the time where like she wrote left-handed. Yeah, because I'm one of the only left-handed people in the family. And she was like, they used to beat them with sticks, like the kids, if they were left-handed, because it was known as like, I might even, don't quote us on this, but it might even be like a witchcraft thing. And they used to beat them until they could write right-handed. And it was always funny finishing Christmas and coming out over the last couple of weeks she always used to get someone to write the Christmas cards because she would shake when she wrote but she couldn't go back to being left-handed um which is like totally nuts compared to like what it is now obviously back then it was like segregation that was the problem like left-handed or right-handed stuff like that but then you come into it now like there's other problems in modern life of people being segregated for different reasons but yeah she used to tell us the maddest stories like of being brought up in that environment. I'm pretty sure she got chased around like mango fields and stuff because mango was like the most expensive fruit in Portugal to sell or something. So all the kids used to go and deliberately steal them and stuff just to generally wind up the teachers because they were sleeping there and stuff as well. Um, so yeah, she told us all of the all of the culture from that side of the world. Uh, um, and it was just nuts compared to like what I was brought up in because I was like seriously lucky really well off kid probably probably a little bit of a spoiled brat at times but not really in the sense of I got everything what I wanted I was always taught to like work a little bit but me hearing them stories from her compared to like my upbringing was just nuts yeah um because we we've talked about it a few times like since especially since like uh during the Black Lives Matter thing that you said because you did a post then and I think that's when you first sort of like publicly said um this is like sort of my background um, another thing that uh, we've spoken about a lot about Yanin is sh she was born and brought up in Portugal, but she spent quite a long time in, in India as well, which is a, a, probably a surprise to a lot of people um, with a time in Goa. Yeah, so I can't actually remember the exact time frames, but as far as I'm aware, it was something like maybe like born in Portugal, raised in Portugal till about like 12, 13, something like that, then jump into india goa i'm actually i'm pretty sure she actually had her first kid in goa oh really uh, one of the uncles and then ended up moving to england at about it was anywhere between 18 to 21 and i remember her saying like back at that time like when she moved over here like she was the only black woman in her area like people like you're talking like the local corner shops and stuff like that not the local corner shops, but what would be the equivalent of our Sainsbury's now? She would be like, people would stop and look in the aisles and be like, she is the only woman around here in this like little, like, you know, the area that I'm talking about. Cause I actually, funnily enough, live in the exact area now, but, um, you know, like people would stop and look. Um, and it's funny, my grandma on my mom's side, who was completely Queens English, English, white British, whatever you want to say, whatever, trying to be politically correct here, yeah, white British. 
she would say the same thing. She was over a different area of Newcastle in the Northeast. And she said like, in, in a positive way, like when people first came to the country, if there was a black person or a black individual in a supermarket, like it was normal to look because you hadn't seen them apart from on TV when people start, first started migrating. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's a weird one because there's, there's like, a, there's actual intrigue, which is what everyone's natural inclination is when they see something different, they're like, this is different, I want to know more. But then there's the fine line between that person's individual intrigue is happening once in their day, whereas for your grandma, it's happening 50, 60, 70 times or however many times in a day or a week. So for the one person looking in the supermarket thinking, oh, I've not seen a black person before, but for the black woman who's going in the supermarket saying, oh, there's another one staring. So it can get a bit uncomfortable on that side. Yeah, but like I even remember, let's face it, like, do you not think people were shocked when we were in school that we were friends? 100% people were. Yeah, like, because <laughs> it was almost like, and let's, let's just not beat around the bush. Like, I wasn't in the group, but like, we still spoke as me and you were friends, mm-hmm. but like, you probably had a group and I had a group. And it was like, it was an unwritten, like, segregation just by like, just by chance. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like it was like people would be you just didn't really like put two and two together or like other people didn't we did because we yeah. spoke to each other and we were friends and we went to the gym together and like i remember like we started the gym together when we probably couldn't even lift a two and a half kilo dumbbell <laughs> or something like that but like exactly outside of that gym like people were probably like eh, how do they like click together well that's it and i think even since um even since like school and and things more recently when when we have been out and about together or when I'm at the gym and another school friend comes, they're like, whoa, you, st- you still keep in touch with each other? And I'm like, well, yeah, but it's obviously, it's it's easier to not understand that when you're not seeing it all the time, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, 100%. Um, and yeah, so did, did she did she ever tell you like, um, like explicitly, like the sort of struggles and things? Because growing up, y- you do have a lot of like diverse friends, obviously, not just myself, but there's there's other groups that you you're in a, a lot of circles. I'll, I'll put it that way. So it's not just like you, you don't just hang around with the same um, couple of I'll, I'll use your language uh, white British lads um, yeah. from school, but you you're in like a lot of circles. So is, do you think that comes from her influence, or is how do you think that happens? I think I think the main thing she didn't really tell us the bad stuff because I was probably too young to understand it, but I think she just always taught us to be open minded. And I would definitely say that like me having traveled more and I'll give you an example, like me saying before my parents took us here, there and everywhere on holiday and stuff like that. Them doing that, like me being in different cult, everyone in England, the majority, oh, sorry, not everyone in England, everyone in Newcastle, the northeast of England has only ever went to Spain on holiday, right? <laughs> Let's face it, like the majority, until you get to 16 and you're going to branch out and travel yourself, you've only went to, you've only been to Spain, okay? Like I was taking like a four or five year old, like Jamaica, Cuba, like to different places, right? So straight away, like people being, being nice to me from different cultures and different color of the skin and stuff like that, then it made, probably made me more open-minded when I was traveling down to London. Like London has a much bigger influence of, and much much more diversity in london than there is up north there's still a thing up north like now where i would say that me and this isn't a bad thing just because they don't know better but me compared to quite a few of my friends will be probably a lot more open-minded than other people mm-hmm. uh, going into situations where they meet new people of different cultures and different backgrounds and stuff like that and um, just because they haven't seen it yeah and because you're not really educated on it Um, that's it that's it I think like when you meet someone that you have a perception of what that race is like and then you meet a few people or you go to the country and it dispels that myth then it's sort of like your mind opens naturally because you're like oh well I always thought this person was going to be like this but they're actually like this and then what what about if that person that I think is going to be like that is actually like this so you you sort of like dispel all these like prejudices that you have in your mind when when you're like opened up to more environments yeah it, the, like there's a massive one like that and i'll just say it because i don't mind like speaking my mind so much but like prejudice of like right in newcastle people are just like people are different here like indian culture you have a corner shop right you start going south it's like all right indian people have billion pound companies and boohoo man you start going more south well indian people are probably the best but like do you know what i mean like it's like 
the stereotype as you go more south is actually more positive mm, yeah. when you think about it that way so yeah it, it's a funny thing like i think like gradually like it's moving further north as well and it almost sounds like i'm bad mouth in the northeast and i'm not what i'm saying is like people just generally like it just depends what your upbringing is like and it depends and i was always like really open-minded like probably from that background of like being brought up by my dad and the way he took me around everywhere in different countries and also my grandma having that influence i'm lucky not a lot of people have that so yeah. they've got to learn from the mistakes themselves when they're first in that situation 100 percent um and as you mentioned your dad there um he he's a proper grafter and i think his work ethic is is instilled in you very much so his sort of background as well coming from like um you i think you said market stalls first and then retail yeah what did you say sorry market stalls yeah so he i can't even remember what it would be and i don't know he did like furniture started making furniture car boot sales like in a fish and chip shops um and then going into like uh the first ever property and that would be how the ball started rolling and going into like he probably like two avenues, main avenues, construction or property, stuff like that. And then just having sort of like, just being able to turn your hand at any sort of business and just trying to work to it until it gets to a point where it runs itself. And I think that's like the mindset that I have. And it's the mindset I try and treat every business that I sort of have as like separate ventures, even though they're the same. So like the gym and the online business is like totally separate in my eyes. I try not to cross them over. I try to work just as hard at one is just as hard at the other and it probably fluctuates at different times of the year but like having that work ethic from like whatever it is just working hard to it until it builds to a point where you can just leave it or move on so yeah definitely i think that uh that work ethic was instilled in me from a pretty young age yeah 100 percent. like and and the thing that i want uh the the thing that i sort of want to summarize what i'm trying to say here is that <clears throat> when obviously um let's not beat around the bush. A lot of people will know you from Love Island, but when they see yeah. this, this poster boy from Love Island, he's the, the 22 white kid from Newcastle. Cause that's what most people are going to see you as. They're not actually going to see a pretty much a person that any immigrant in the country can relate to because sec you're a second generation immigrant. If you think about it as I'm first, but our, our like sort of backgrounds are very similar. So dad and market stores going into shops and property. And I think, Indians especially will definitely relate to that, but most immigrants will see that someone's came from a different country, work their bollocks off um, for their kids to be able to have like a, a, a really good work ethic and smash it in whatever field they choose to do. Yeah, I mean, like the, probably the main thing that we always used to say is like how hard our parents were in like a fair way. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, like just like being really strict with school stuff, but like, and being really strict with, I remember like us saying about like summer holidays and stuff like that, you would go to the shop. I would do something, I don't know what it would be. It would be some crazy construction labor and task or something like that, whether it would be like hump and stone, hump and scaffold and stuff like that. But like, I was never fully allowed a normal summer holidays. I was never allowed, like even now, some of my friends have Call of Duty. I cannot even like, I wouldn't even know how to start a game. And that is <laughs> because like when I was young I never was allowed to do the video game thing but at the same time like I remember all my friends being like oh well your dad's got more money he just he gets you those trainers he gets you this he gets you that and I think yeah but like you were allowed to sit in your bedroom with a bag of multi-pack crisps for six weeks and like play Call of Duty whereas like I used to have to go and like used to like literally kick us out of bed at like seven in the morning and then I would be made to do something which is absolutely fine and i would get paid for it it would be nothing in relation to what you would have now like it's laughable but still it was like you go to work and you get something out of it that's it it's instilling the work ethic which at the time you always sort of begrudge because you're like oh no it's six weeks holidays i want to play with my mates and all that if everyone else is on call of duty i want to be on call of duty but afterwards yeah. when when it's not a it's not an effort it's not a pain to get up in the morning and smash out work because you've got the work ethic and the discipline that's when you look back and went oh yeah i understand what he was doing yeah i mean it it anything now it's it's funny i always speak about this like and i say that 
anything now seems easy because of the shitty jobs that like I was like made to do. And like, I wasn't even like hard done by. There's kids who are all over, who are done by way, way, way harder than, than me. And they've done way worse jobs and stuff like that. But at the same time, everything was like instilled with me from a young age. And I'll always like use that, like going to the gym and training a couple of people that I'm probably friends with, that I'll probably get on with, that I'll probably like, is gonna be a piece of piss compared to getting up at seven o'clock in the morning and pouring rain and doing something like that. Yeah. Uh, 100%. Or I think the other thing was it was like stick in at school to be quite honest or oh, this is what you're going to end up doing true um, but but you ended up taking a different path and your dad did want you to stay at school, you ended up going to university because your dad wanted you to as well but you ended up um, dropping out and, and taking fitness a bit more full time so so we'll pivot from like your, your background to to more of like the, the athletic side of you and um I know you were into boxing as a kid, but you were also into like a few other sports as well. So just talk about other sports other than the gym and then how you got into the gym. Yeah, I mean, I was like every kid, wanted to be a professional footballer, absolutely football mad. Um, knew every player on every team. It was a ridiculous, like I would, I would have been amazing at a trivia quiz, but not really the most athletic kid. I was, so try to play a little bit of football from a young age all the way through. Did a little bit of swimming, which I was actually better at much better at and I probably should have stuck at that because it's more of a niche sport and I probably could have done mm. some, some of that um, but as a kid getting up at trying to get forced to go up start swimming before school and after school every single day which I did for a little bit like it doesn't last when you try and tell a kid like you should stick at this so that was a little bit of a dabble and then um, coming to like sort of like 15 years old boxing was like something that I got introduced to by my dad again because he was into it but it was more of like a weight loss and training thing it was just something to try and like keep fit and the reason for all of that was because I never really like excelled at any sports until that age at least because I was like a little bit of a chubby kid I wasn't very athletic I wasn't really quick I remember like hate and cross country at school and hate and like athletics day I absolutely hated sports day because I remember being like the slowest or one of the slowest and just thinking like this is so embarrassing Um, like I was totally 110% a kid that didn't want to take the top off in the pool like on a holiday I have a really really vivid memory of like being in Mexico and meeting these family friends and me like jumping in the pool with a top on when I was with uh, my dad and my mom when they were still together and like we're in Mexico and Cancun and me just like refusing point blank, probably had my first crush on a girl or something like that. Don't know how old I was, but um, me just really not wanting to take my top off in the swim pool and like I didn't. Um, and that was a, like, I have a really vivid memory of that holiday for some reason. I think I was coming at that age where you start like thinking about girls and you start thinking about like, you start being more conscious of your body image. You don't really care when you're that young, when you're probably like younger than 12, maybe. But then that like 12 to 16 phase is really when you start like looking in the mirror and like you see other kids. And there is a few little sly remarks at school by other people. You wear glasses, you're the kid with glasses, you're ginger, you're the ginger kid, you're the fat kid, you're the fat kid. I was that one. So like, whatever it is, if you're skinny, you're the skinny kid. I think that's important that people say that as well. Like, like I was a bit of a bigger kid, but if you get picked on for being skinny, it's just as bad. Um, but yeah, that was, that was my thing. And once like, once people taste blood in school, you know what it's like, it's almost vicious, isn't it? So that's what they went with with mine. And I, went, I remember coming home a lot of times and not really being happy with the way I look. So like going on and being upset as a kid, that was when I first started like doing a little bit of boxing fitness. I wouldn't say like competitive boxing, but boxing fitness anyway. Yeah, because um, I think that that period is actually, so we met in high school and by that time, I think you had started to uh, sort of grow a lot more. So you weren't like, a, you have always been a big lad, but you, yeah. you were starting to take a bit more shape by then. Yeah. And, um, but the, the, there's obviously images online, especially when you were when you were on tv obviously a lot of images came out well a lot of all of your information came out <laughs> about yeah. everything there was there was things about your dad there was things about your your body image uh, because everyone was surprised back then because you were so lean on the show yeah but back and i think it might actually be the same holiday because there's a picture of you like standing next to a pool and you do look like the, the chubby kid that you're saying yeah, um, yeah. so do you think the gym was the turning point of when you 
you so like obviously boxer size was good but when you got into the gym do you think that was the one that you actually sort of uh quote unquote caught the bug with and that's the one that propelled like your body to change the most yeah i mean definitely i think i like the boxing style of training but i always i actually enjoyed the learning side of it and i think i used to i remember us texting in high school and stuff like that but i used to go to bed like reading article after article after article and this is from like a kid who's like 14 15 years old probably 15 year nine whatever that is that first year of high school when you go to a tier three system um like year nine 15 years old like what kid like goes to school all day every day for five five six hours a day and then wants to come back and like go to the gym and read books on going to the gym like it was but that's that's what i sort of like started doing and like once you start seeing results and I think I was angry at like the way that I felt about myself. Like instead of brushing off comments and stuff, I took them personally, but almost channeled them into being like, right, I'm going to really, really, really work at this. And the high school years, the three main high school years, there was a massive change in me. And I went from obviously like we met when I was probably halfway through that mm-hmm. uh, coming into high school and being like, I was almost like had a vengeance against the world of like, I'm going to prove every girl wrong who I've ever had a crush <laughs> on and like being pied by every lad on the football, de- on the A team and I was on the B team, like the, like I wasn't quick enough and stuff like that. Like the rugby team, anything like that. I was just like angry at everyone and I just channeled it into that direction. But I think I sort of caught the bug as I, as I started seeing results, I realized that I actually liked the process Whereas I probably started from just being like, just lose weight, just lose weight, just lose weight. But funnily enough, once you start losing weight, then you start getting a little bit stronger and you start getting a little bit faster. That's actually what switches and catches the bug. I mean, you have a little bit more training experience than you probably let on to the people on the podcast, but you know that you start a diet or you start like January, perfect example right now. You start because you want to lose a bit of weight, but then when you actually see yourself get stronger, you get a little bit addicted to that strength or you get a little bit addicted to that like speed on the treadmill or something like that yeah a hundred percent um i recently had a, a bodybuilder called uh manj on a few episodes ago and um he basically had like a similar situation where he was he was quite overweight when he was growing up and he talked about like all these comments similar to yourself that were coming in little jibes even from like cousins of his not just like friends at school um but similar to you, he he channeled them into, like a, like to propel him upwards in, in the gym direction. Um, but he, he did say that himself that he he suffered with depression then because that like he's getting constantly hammered left, right, and center mm-hmm. because he, of his weight. And it can it can always go two ways. It can either spiral downwards, or obviously them comments can get used to propel you upwards. And fortunately for him, that he did the latter. And it sounds similar, not the the mental health side of things, because as far as I'm aware, um, at that point th- there was none of that. But um, for for you, but more so the the comments were used as like fuel to just get you get you into the gym and stop moving. Yeah, I mean, it actually didn't happen as quite as smoothly as that. I think something triggered at one point, but at first I went completely the opposite way. I just ended up like probably binge eating and like really badly binge eating, like. I used to smash everything and like hide it from my parents and stuff like that, which every kid does to a certain extent. Like, but I think I used to use that as a comfort blanket, which then obviously made the problem worse. And then I don't know what it was. I don't know what clicked in my head, but like there was a bit of a, like a one day or one week where it changed from that being like a negative to then being like turning it into a positive. And then every comment or anything like that from that point was like, right, I'm going to do it for the right reasons rather than, using it to shy up and make make almost the stereotype even worse 100 percent. and this is some of the conversation that i had with him is that like it takes obviously for each individual that shift in mentality is going to be vastly different like hopefully it does happen but for some people it doesn't and obviously that's a really a negative thing for them but when it does happen like it's it's that sense of maturity to use the use all this in the positive direction and then when it does it's just a constant source of like inspiration because every time you get like a little jibe you can go into the gym and your, your session's going to be a, b- a bit better even when you get a compliment as I s- assume you would have at the time when you're going from a chubby kid to to getting a bit more lean and you can see like your biceps a bit more and somebody else says it then you've got even more so it's just constant <clears throat> and like 
um, all them factors in, in the sort of right direction. But I wanna, I wanna go back to one specific day uh, in the gym. So, and this is where you, you're getting comfortable, you're lifting a good amount of weight. And there's two old guys in the gym who, who were like, oh, he's looking good. Uh, maybe, maybe he can help us out. <laughs> um, so obviously like getting into the gym, I think it was when we were, was it when we were in sixth form, something like that? Between that sort of like year 11, 12 phase, so like finishing school, that final year, going into saying if you want to stay on for A-levels. Um, yeah, there was a there was a moment where you could, I was getting a lot of compliments then. I wasn't getting a lot of compliments like, look, like you really look good, but it was more like, it was more like you've made a massive change. And this was starting to happen like on the regular at school and stuff like that. People were like, God, what happened to him after the summer holidays or something like that? And then the final sort of, yeah, I remember like one time significantly, like these two blokes, I can't remember what what they did for a living, but they were the type of people that when we had free periods between like one and three in the day, when no one was really in the gym, we used to go and smash it because take loads of caffeine, go and yeah. smash your gym sessions, like the glory days. Um, and these two guys would always be into the probably businessmen they could just take time off whenever they want but they came up to me and they're like god like you've made a massive change like you seem to know what you're doing in here like you train a little bit differently like what some of the other people do like will you start training with we'll pay you on your like lunch break they thought I was on a lunch break but obviously I had free periods that was it so that was where that was what spiked the business-minded Adam be like god like I'm actually all right at this now maybe I could actually do something with this because like telling a 60, 17 year old kid, 16 year old kid, now 16 year old kid that you can, that one, you look good and I will pay you 40 quid cash in your pocket, which used to, I probably got that in six to seven hours working in a shop, like pay 40 quid for 45 minutes to an hour to come and train with like straight away that one hour. I was just like, right, I've got loads of pocket money. <laughs> so that, it was a bit of a funny thing at first, but then once I started realizing, I was like, well, actually, I could actually use this and do this as a job. And it's something that I love to do because I felt like I was just sitting there doing my thing and then them following. Yeah. And I think you showed that you were business minded from the early because you quickly came up with the name Scope. Like Scope isn't something that just magically appeared after Love Island. I remember back then, I think I probably still got photos somewhere of, the original scope logo and the spider-man writing and all this yeah. Uh, yeah yeah i remember so probably that happened it was they were that only really happened for four weeks with them two guys um and it was in i still remember it was the gym that was along the road from school wasn't even supposed to do it didn't know you needed insurance didn't know you needed a qualification to do it didn't know that like everyone in the gym who actually works there who's their real trainers who were terribly out of shape and were clueless but they would get annoyed with me by doing it in their gym because they are the people that are trying to gain that money. Um, so all of those factors didn't really have a clue about it. So started researching about it as I was still taking the money, obviously, and still training them as you do. Um, and started just looking into like personal training and what it sort of, like if there was any qualifications there, started seeing things like that, started looking at like celebrity trainers online, um, like, the PTs that I sort of like saw, I can't remember who it was. It was a Nike trainer. I think he was called like Jamie Velocity and he trained like people like Anthony Joshua and stuff like that. But back then it was like someone else because I think Joshua wasn't even good then. Like not good, but like, you know what I mean? He wasn't like up and coming. He wasn't like, big, yeah. He yeah. wasn't the heavyweight champion of the world that he is now. He was like pretty youngster. So this guy, like, so I started following him and I used to be like, yeah, I want to do what that guy does. So yeah, started pretty much with the name Sculpt, got a little business card designed um, and started running boot camps out of the church hall that was again around the corner again from school with a little Sculpt logo. It was the Spider-Man writing, which I didn't even really realize at the time, but then I just went with it. Um, and then we started making some YouTube, not YouTube, some Instagram tutorial videos and videos of me training, starting an Instagram page. Yeah, which it, it really did start taking off. And then th there was a point where like you, there was like a two way sort of like two paths in front of you. Cause I remember you went off to uni and although you were admittedly only there for like a couple of weeks, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and then you quickly soon, soon came back. Like, what was that decision again? Like uh, as, as I alluded to before, 
with like a sort of a, a strict traditional sort of parent with, with your dad and he was sort of like saying that you should go the traditional route but then you just sort of persisted and went I want to I want to do the personal training thing well I didn't really know what I wanted to do then because I think I was still focused on my own mission because I wasn't content with how I looked still obviously I was getting better in other people's eyes but I really really had the fire on my belly then being like I can actually I can actually really get in some serious nick here and like maybe excel myself so people actually start looking at me like on Instagram on looking at me for advice but in the other side of my life I was still going to school still doing my studies I think I still did art and business do you know what I mean which business I like but it I don't know how I once did art, do you know what I mean? Like looking at who I am now. But anyway, so still in the back of my head, it was like go to university, do something like, whether it be like something academic, like architecture, like business, like accounting, like something like that. That was always the goal. And I just found the gym still as a hobby at that point because when I was researching, like I was saying about personal trainers and stuff like that, stereotypically you ask, or at least when I asked around to people who were older than me, everyone who spoke to us then was our personal training and like jobs like that are just for people that can't do uni like that was what the general consensus was and that's what every single person said was who was an older individual so like my dad and one of these things that probably the only thing that he's got wrong uh what he would hate to admit and like a lot of people around us though said the same thing like all that people that i looked up to uncles and stuff like that nah, that job's just for people that are too stupid to get into uni. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just continue it because I love it, but I'll go to uni and do something else. So I signed up for like a business marketing degree in Leeds Met. And spent a total of how long there? Oh, I think it was 21 days. Not even that. <laughs> but at I this remember- point, you were making like you were making decent amount of money with the boot camp and stuff. And even when you went to Leeds, I remember you saying that, there was a couple of lads in the gym there who were uh, who already followed you on Instagram or something, but you didn't have a massive social media platform like yeah. you do now, but they already followed you then. So you, you were getting a, your, your name about. I think by the time I got to the university point, like I stood out as like, yeah, you can tell that guy in a t-shirt, like he lifts, like um, I was massively into like more bodybuilding training then and not as much functional training, but like I started standing out then, like I was six foot five, which I obviously still am now but I really had finished my growth spurt. And then it was like, oh, you can tell he sort of like moves some weight or something like that. It's pretty strong compared to other people. And that's when I started like seeing a lot more interest into like people in the gym in Leeds. I was only, I only went to the gym in Leeds twice or three times, I think, in a different gym that was outside the uni. And I was starting to get people. I think I even got offered a job. It, obviously PT gyms in like big chain gyms, like exercise for less will offer anyone a job so it's not a compliment really but they did offer us a job and I thought oh well I could do this alongside uni or something like that and then after that I just thought why am I why am I even doing it like if I can actually make money doing this like I know that I can do boot camps wherever it be for as little or as much as I want to charge I know that I can like train people because people are obviously interested if I had a base in the area where I actually grew up or at least close to where I grew up you can guarantee that like family, friends and friends would probably be interested. It's not hard to find people out of shape in England. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Um, and then, so after this, the, the uni phase, you come back, you go to Northumbria Uni, you do any PT course there because you realise that you need actual qualifications and you can't just charge people without anything. Yeah. But, but you're working on the side as well. So it's, uh, you, you were doing uh, work with your dad, I believe, yeah? Yeah, so came back from uni, obviously broke, like broke the news to family and just being like, nah, not doing it. Not do- it's going to be a waste of three years. I remember like going down the corridor and like the halls and just like seeing like three lads that I knew smoke a joint. And I was just like, if I stay here for three years, like I know they're probably going to get a degree, but like, I just thought, is this the stereo? Like, is this the like lifestyle that I'm going to live? Like for three years, like don't get us wrong. Like I've liked a party and I've went out and done stuff, but I just thought like, can't be asked like just doing this for three years and like scraping through a degree like I'd rather get started now and make some real money and I think I was always driven by that um so comes back basically asks my dad for a job on the scaffold in sight um so doing the most horrendous job like just seven or four every single day 
flipping scaffold pipes and putting it up buildings and is actually really really good for getting strong by the way but yeah. what a horrible job in the winter like freezing cold metal pipes and trying to throw them up buildings which they're about eight and a half stone so did that seven or four monday to friday and then on a weekend took a six month course at northumbria to do personal training to get like i think it was like a mini diploma it's like under a foundation degree or a foundation degree and then i like stayed on to do a couple of extra little courses for like pre and postnatal training and kettlebells and stuff anything i could get for free basically um and did that and then the rest was pretty much history after that the second i could i was stopping doing any sort of laboring manual labor <laughs> get myself into a gym and start training people and the first gym was pure gym no the gym so you on cossie high street yeah, yeah, yeah. so the first the first job i got was at a big public gym one of them budget gyms we all know them we've all got them in the area one of the big hitters and um what what was uh so I'm going to ask what it was like, but I probably should preface it by saying that the second gym you worked at was um, a very high-end, luxurious gym. So what were the sort of differences between the two? And how did how do you think like them two sort of helped you to where you are sort of now? I think the, f- the first gym was the best thing that ever happened. It was in the sense of like teaching me it is literally, if you're in business, it is survival of the fittest. There was there was a conveyor belt of unsuccessful PTs that used to come in for a few weeks, maybe a couple of months and just go out. And I used to see them work in Sainsbury's after. I used to see them like do waiter and jobs and stuff like that. Like no, they just didn't have the business savvy or the drive to like stick it out and do the free work and like give people the free advice and stuff like that, that they needed to try and land a client. Um, there used to be 15 PTs on a board and it was just like 3,000 members, get what you can. And it was pretty hard to advertise yourself in that environment and stand out from the crowd because the thing is when when people go into them big gyms like that, unless they're clued up already, it just looks to them like, oh, there's 15 PTs, they must exactly know exactly the same as each other, which is not the case. There's some like terribly motivated and out of shape pts and pts with lack of knowledge and bad standards like promoting terrible things whether it be diet advice or training advice and it's not like that the pt course i'm pretty sure i would put good money on you passing the pt course like right in this second now and it's just it is as simple as that the extra learning comes after it's like anything you go to an accountant you go to a solicitor you know there's a standard of who's good and who's bad yeah yeah because I, I remember you saying that you learned a lot more um from your own sort of knowledge and your own sort of um like learning journey in, in the gym than you did in the on the course i remember like w- w- when you were doing it that we had them conversations yeah. at the time i remember like coming home from even the job when i was at the gym group um when i was at that first gym and like still researching like nutrition and stuff like that um and this was the first ever time that like macros and calories sort of started like really getting driven into like flexible diet and then if it fits your macros and I definitely cottoned on to like the scientific approach rather than the just hearsay and like the general consensus like some of these PTs were very old-fashioned in the way that went on and carried out stuff like it, it stemmed from like military training and stuff like that and I think I just I looked at who was the most successful in the industry and looked at like what they learned and just went home and read and read and read as much as I could to try and like be the best and improve. But not just from a, not just from a training and coaching perspective, but from a business perspective as well. Like, right. What does that person do that? Like, why are they a good PT? Like, how do they get started and stuff like that? And you can, you can make some serious money even in like the, the budget gyms, like, cause you, as you said, 3000 clients like uh, are, are there if you're able to get through to them. And um, I'm, I'm guessing when you said the first gym is probably like the, the biggest learning curve is probably because of that. Cause you, you, you're learning how to adapt your personal training to each and every individual. Yeah. Well, the massive difference with that to what it is now is you're almost pitching yourself to the people that are in that gym but a 
lot of people just get a gym membership just because they think like, oh, I'm going to make myself feel good by going in and just going on the treadmill for an hour and walking or something like that with no real knowledge of what they've got to do, what plan they're going to do, how to get actual real results. Now you going up to them and trying to sell yourself and trying to maybe be like, oh, come over here and try this. This is better. Like people come to scopes they know they have a good idea that they're going to come in for personal training. You can't like come off the street. There's no high street like there was in that other gym. So they're coming for a reason. They're coming to get trained. Whereas in that one, you're almost pitching yourself, having to try and like learn how to talk to the individual. And this is especially where like my personal skills developed in the sense of like going from that guy, maybe the year below me or my age that wants to just look like me to like maybe old Irene that like needs to learn how to like get out of a chair better because she's got a bad back and wants to help improve her posture like it's different things like that so that definitely helped me from a personal skill sense to like right this is how I need to talk and market to them people and also this is how I need to talk and market them people and also how to train them like you've got to find some common ground to talk about it's like anything yeah yeah you can't be talking about having a session on the weekend with the 22 year old and do the same thing as you say with 65 year old Irene or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly and then the second gym afterwards was very different it was as I said before like a high-end sort of higher-end gym it was the creme de la creme in Newcastle of PTs uh, Aurora so do, do you want to talk about a, a bit about that yeah so after I think I spent exactly to the day almost a year in my first gym um but outside of that I suppose I got headhunted in a way, even though it's a bit of a weird thing because I didn't really get a job offer. Um, got contacted by a highly regarded personal training gym studio. Um, I knew what it was in the area because like everyone sort of did, it had like four or five people who had probably quite a big social media following um, in terms of like local areas. Like they were known for like being in insane shape, having quite good following, like pretty hardcore training. Um, so got contact, contacted by one of the partners there and said, oh, you should come along and see, see what you want to do. And then they offered me a job role, but like a rental self-employed job role. So like I went in and I started having to pay rent to rent the space. But obviously because of that, the way that gym looked, the private, the privacy, the exclusivity, it was like, you can move up here and try and like target a better clientele, somewhere more private, somewhere where you're going to train with real real athletes almost where like the training is serious there is no bad pts there and so on and so on so that's where i went to on the next step and sort of moved on to there so in your mind you're going back to jamie velocity and thinking oh this this is my next step to get into sort of his levels yeah so there was loads of those people on instagram who i thought like yeah that's where i want to be like We've spoke about it loads of times. I think there's like a kid that trains more ball, the kid that trains like Thor for Thor's part on like, you know, the, the, you see a couple of people and you're like, yeah, like Joe Rogan on a podcast, you know, mm-hmm. you have them people be like, yeah, he's, he's the game where you want to be. So I saw these people in this gym that was in my local area, Aurora, and I thought like, yeah, they look absolutely class. Like that's where I want to be because they're like real trainers. There's no shock and form. There's no like, terrible diet and protocols like they know what they're doing there and i'll be put in that category with those people if i go with them so that's where i went and then obviously going into there everything at the start was really good in the sense of like the, like i was training with people that were more advanced than me so it pushed me on and um, had the private studio obviously it was a slow start compared to the big gym where you can pull clients off the treadmill and like try and hope hope that you can sell to them but um eventually started building a business but everything there wasn't what it seems from the business point of view compared to like just having the faces of that gym because it was run Which sort of shockingly. sums up a, a social media presence you think it's yeah. all swimmingly on the surface and then you see behind the photos is a is not what you, you see basically <laughs> Yeah, like it was it was a gym that was like basically going into the ground, but had some absolutely insane trainers that were working out of there. And it still had the reputation of being like one of the best at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that was where I was left. And so not getting too much into how or why it happened, but um, at the same time when that was sort of coming to an end uh, at Aurora, um, the actual business, not you, well, 
yeah, your time there as well. Uh, while everything was going like up in the air, you also went to the Reebok gym, and this is probably where your love of CrossFit is uh, is sort of uh, grown from. Um, so yeah, like the gym, you could you could tell like I was getting busier and busier, and there was a there was two other PTs there like who were getting really really busy as well. But the gym and the whole the gym was just being like left almost by the owner and it was just getting quieter and quieter. Like no one knew when it opened and shut. Like we have our own set of keys just to go and open up for our private clients, but people were turning up for classes and there was no one there to take them. And like, it was starting to get sketchier and sketchier. So, um, and when you said once that there was a, it was a class, but only one person turned up. So it ended up being a one-on-one. Yeah. Like that would happen quite a lot, but to be fair, like when I was first starting off sculpt, like that, that happened to me a couple of times as well, where like seven o'clock on a Friday night, like one person's turning up. And like, to be fair, that can still happen every now and then. Like I've been on, in on a Friday and at 5 p.m. you've got 15 people, but then at 7 p.m. you've got one person. Like it just happens yeah. like that sometimes. So it's not the, that, I wouldn't say that determines whether something's doing well or not. But um, where was I going with that? So Reebok was another place where I just found, a, I, I basically went there to try the training and um, went there to try something new, try something different because I was quite bodybuilding orientated, found, found that it was really cool, found it really interesting, like pushing to different higher intensities, more functional movements. So I started doing a little bit of that. And then obviously in the meantime, knowing that my business or place of work, at least the place of work that I was renting out was potentially going down the pan. Um, started looking there to personal train as well. So I was basically running in between Reebok and running in between um, Aurora as a place to personal train and trying to take my all my clients. And then eventually Aurora is now sculpted because it's the same premises. Yeah, so Aurora ended up shutting down for maybe a couple of weeks. And then I just thought, me being me at that point, like I had a few months at Reebok of like building up a client base, but it was pretty much all of my client base anyway, just moving to a different gym because like everyone was tremendous and moved with us. Um, And then I just thought that like this opportunity was on a plate and it was either do something now and try and create my own spin on it because I was almost doing it there or thereabouts anyway, like all the clients that were there were pretty much my clients or this one other PT. And like, there was no other clients there. So if I could do it with the clients that I have, I thought, why not try and start my own place and start my own gym? Yeah, because you had the foundation already like sort of set up with the clients. I remember you saying that even a few um, from the gym at Gossie sort of came with you to to scope like one or two. Um, And then like, obviously you've got your Reebok lot and then you've got the ones that were already at Aurora. Um, how, how old were you at this time? Because uh, uh, many people will probably see from the outside because obviously Love Island was the sort of, the spotlight was on you then that you've came out and afterwards you sort of developed scoped. But this was a bit before. So just to put it in like a sort of time scale, um, like around how old were you? And then when did Love Island come afterwards? So I think like 2017 when I turned 21, 2017 when I turned 21 opened the gym a couple of months after that and then six months after that going on Love Island so the gym was probably only open for like five months um five months after I went on Love Island but yeah like we started scope just really really quickly like ripped everything out of that last gym started started the gym as a shell just like an empty unit and just started building it back up and like the makeover of the way the images looked was like insane. It was like everything that I ever wanted at that time um, looked absolutely mint. Like the clients absolutely loved it when they first came in and like the, try to make the gym Instagrammable because I was quite clued up with like how important marketing was at that point and still is now. Like, I think that was one thing that I always got, was pretty switched on because I know some really good PTs, but I always seem to like get the knack of Instagram before anyone else. Um, and like know what you needed to put out there to try and get a client base because I was segregated and I was I didn't have a high street to like get clients off like I had to bring people there and give people free advice online to try and then land them as a client 
Yeah, hundred percent. And the the gym that um, for for people who are listening, who people who haven't seen the gym um, or haven't been there, sorry, the the gym is basically in an industrial unit, and it's like they're massive sort of like shells, uh, as you were saying. But yeah, and building it, um, you you ended up doing you and the family, um, Cheryl, your stepmom, and your dad ended up doing the majority of the work in there. You brought in some obviously external help for a few bits and bobs, but you ended up like getting hands and knees and painting all the walls x y yeah, and z we had like a six week turnaround um absolutely mental probably the best family bonding and the worst family bonding you could ever have but, <laughs> it was a uh, three two one and go when we got the keys it was like rip everything out total family job and then a few close other individuals outside the family but jack of all trades that were like coming in like trying to put flooring down trying to like paint the walls i remember my little brother painting the walls with his um like Cheryl, my stepmom, like God knows what she was doing, like all sorts, probably hammer and nail and painting the walls at the same time. Uh, it was totally nuts. And in six weeks, we turned around and for six weeks, my schedule was pretty much like PT six till 10, then 10 or three, try and go and do whatever I can. And I'm absolutely terrible with a paintbrush, with a hammer, with anything like that, just trying to do whatever I got told to do and then go back to work three or eight or three or nine PT on a night. So for six weeks, it was pretty brutal. But like the fire that you've got when something's your own, like during that time when you're building it up, when you're creating something, like you're just not bothered at all. It was the easiest easiest and hardest six weeks of my life. Yeah, I get you. And it wasn't just painting walls though. You created like a full second layer uh, uh, on the gym as well. Like it was a one-story gym with a little staircase to an office. Yeah. But the the There's like a full second floor on there now. Yeah, we're pretty much double the size by putting in a mezzanine floor and basically like doubling, doubling the gym size. Um, if anyone's seen it, obviously it, and they seen the old version, like it does look like a massive difference. Yeah, definitely. Cause uh, yeah, it is to be fair. Um, and the other way that you used before was Instagrammable and you've obviously got your branding down to a T now, which is, which isn't the old school Spider-Man sculpt sort of thing. Yeah. You've got proper logos, you've got your, um, what what is the phrase that on the bottom of the stairs again? Because you have a really good story about that. What if your the, legs are humble? Yeah. What, yeah. Um, what is it? I can't even remember what it is. I should know this as well. I think it's like watch out your legs are hungover. Basically, I remember I saw like a I saw what was it? It was a cafe or something. And I remember thinking like, oh, that it was a cafe in America and they had like, you know, the classic. I'm trying to think of a phrase that's always there. Because it was a it was a cafe in America with a really specific name, which was a bit of a vulgar name at the same time. Oh, I was like, I was in America on holiday, like, and I remember this cafe being called Egg Slut. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Egg Slut, this is what you were digging at. And I remember <laughs> thinking like, God, that's absolutely mental. Like that's doing there. But they had all these like big quotes on the walls, not in a cringy way, just like really well branded like funny stuff like i don't know like your yoga for like egg slut you know yeah. get it stuff like that um but anyway they were plastered all over the walls and i was like looking around and i was like every single pe- person in here is like getting out the phone and taking a picture and it was like mental like every single person i saw was taking out the phone and i was like i'm gonna do that in the gym because like every single person will take a photo of like one of the walls post it and then everyone will know about the gym so it was just something that I pretty much cottoned on to quite soon. Like, you know what it's like when you go into one of them pure gyms and you want to go in into one of them, the gym groups. It's almost a bit like, oh, I always say it's like hospital-y, don't I? Yeah. Like you go in and it's like big white white and blue walls or white and green walls if it's pure gym. And like, you almost feel like you're walking around in the same sort of thing. So I wanted to make something really different, like cool colors, like neon lights, trying to make big, bold quotes. Um so yeah, that was that was what we did. Like the move, lift, sweat, repeat was the big doors on the shutters and the big, it's plastered all over the walls. All of the quotes were just trying to be Instagrammable because I think if it looks the part, like it's quite easy to get clients to come in there at least once and then hopefully your coaching standards are good enough to keep them. Definitely, definitely. And when you do see like your pictures are majority taken in the gym as well and obviously your lighting is good so that's the main thing people want to see from a gym is does it look cool for instagram because that's where most of the gym pictures are going um and then 
as we alluded to before, you, you're there, you're, you're 21, you're running your gym, you've taken this massive risk in the first place to like drop out of uni and start PT and, and your dad's thinking, oh, maybe it's not the best idea. Then you get an approach from Love Island a few months into um, opening up your own business. And then again, your dad's like, oh, might not be a good idea. Talk us through how that conversation went. Yeah, so I remember uh, basically, long story short, met a guy in a bar like a few when I was in the maybe the gym phase, the first gym PT in like 20, no, before that, 19 years old. I was 19 years old because I remember that. Um, met a guy in a bar. He was a TV producer. I was like, do you want to come for an interview? Go on Geordie Show, which is like local program. Not really what a personal trainer should probably do in my eyes. Like, it's very drink and party orientated. And to be fair, I'm good for a night, but after that, I'm like an old man. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So after that, um, anyway, got a call a few years later, and this guy was like, "Have you broke broken up with?" Hello, blah blah blah. This is me from when I met you. You went, "Have you broken up with your girlfriend?" At the time, I currently had, but I'd also opened school. He was like, "If you come down to London, I might be able to get you on Love Island." And I was like, "God, like." obviously knowing what happened to the people the year before I was like this is massive I thought straight away alarm bells in my head I was like sculpt will be plastered everywhere I could plan this really well so when I come out I already have an online academy ready to go already have an online business already have maybe sculpt hoodies already have like everything I was like I could really manipulate the situation if I can but at the same time like six months what's the rule you don't you don't sleep for the first year of business so like six maybe if even not even six you know four or five months into the business i'm like sit going back to my dad who also financially helped us with the last bit that i needed to get over the line with the gym to like kit it out and stuff like that i'm like oh yeah i'm going away for eight weeks <laughs> see you later straight away you're gonna get a smack in the face and be like no no nah, you're not you're not going anywhere so i was like what I was like trying to tell someone who doesn't understand what the TV program is and how powerful social media is because I mean, he does not probably know even how to send a message on Facebook, never mind Instagram. And we know Instagram's harder. And I was like, no, no, like this will be insane. Like if I last even two weeks on that show, like Sculpt will be on the bottom of the screen because it will come up when I like, what's my job on my name? um it'll like be plastered everywhere like this will be class for the gym just didn't understand it what argued for for like three weeks solid in the house and i still ended up going on pretty bad terms um but try to plan it the best i could for the gym staying alive with cheryl my stepmom and then the pts were there at the time but didn't didn't go down well anyway but it never is when i'm not there to be mm -hmm. quite honest it's always gonna like it's always going to be at like 90%, not quite a hundred, but yeah, like made it, made it happen, went on the show, had a massive following and got a lot of good press and a lot of bad press and a lot of press that just, I knew that I needed to try and like get the gym out there and came out and did what I was going to say, get a million followers, start an online platform. Yeah, it was, it was a really interesting time. I remember like I was at uni and a lot of the school friends that obviously knew that me and you were, were friends and stuff were actually sending me the link. I think it was like in the Chronicle, the first or something. I got sent so many of the same article saying, oh, Adam's going to Love Island. I was, I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I didn't even know what the show was before that, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and it, it was it was like a really big hype sort of hype situation because you were the wild card as well. Yeah, like basically the way it works, you put... The way it works is you get people in happy couples and then people start coming in. Um, but the main lineup is the first 10 people or normally 10 people with five boys and five girls. And from the second, the start of the show, five girls, five boys, and then waited a couple of hours or something and then chucked me in. So like straight away, it was the first time I think, no, maybe the second time they'd done it. They tried it with a girl the year before. Like, so even on day one, it was like, I was the starting lineup, but I was the first like person to like ruffle the feathers is that what it's called well for the feathers yeah yeah but for you uh, marketing wise that's the perfect situation because you are the focal point at that point yeah like straight away like i had to piss people off from 24 hours in because i knew i had to pick a girl and i knew it was going to annoy what whatever boy it was that i picked because you're not safe are you so straight away i was pretty prominent in the press from that from that point and you 
going through the show again uh, a lot of people were sending me messages saying oh he's done this he's done that and um because you were like the the pantomime villain Let, let's put it let's yeah. put it bluntly like you were basically the the troublemaker is that yeah. a conversation that you have going in with the producers and or, or something or is that something that you have in your mind because again you want scope to be prominent is it a little bit of both like you play with the cards you dealt and like when i when i was going in there i was like hmm, like i'm get i'm getting kept a while like in the car before you're driving up into the villa and i just thought something was different obviously walk in realize what the situation is five boys five girls and me so uh, i was like almost talking to myself in my head nodding going yeah i realize what i'm gonna have to do here now <laughs> <laughs> i have to take someone's girl <laughs> so obviously coming in realizing that that was the situation i was in now you either be overly nice and last 30 seconds on the show or you do what you've got to do and also like why not like those five girls in there that are class and i'm still friends with some of them like samira and laura are like unreal i'm trying to think who else there was but off the top of my head i can't um out of the girls um their class, I still speak to them now. So like they will be friends for life, hopefully. And why would I not speak to them people anyway? But obviously the name of the game is to stay on the program. So what are you going to do? But also I'm not going to lie. Like I'm totally hundred percent honest with this. And this is what annoyed people almost. I was too honest because I wasn't ashamed to say it. Like I knew how to keep myself on the show and I knew how to keep myself on the camera for at least the first couple of weeks, like be a bit ballsy and, make sure that you're the center of attention if you're choosing between two girls and you're going to get kept on camera. That's the most important part of the show, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, Where, yeah. Whoever, whoever's choosing on that night, it just so happened that like the fir- first three times I managed to do that and make sure it was me. So after that, I was, it was easy. So you're telling me you didn't go on for love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, anyone who, anyone who says that now it's, I don't even know if the show will still have the same, the same sort of energy as a, it's not as shocking anymore is it no it's no not as much of a surprise when people play the game like we all know what happens like you've got people you've got monsters now like molly may and like who are absolutely killing instagram and stuff like that like absolutely smashing out the park like there's too many clever individuals now like me like without trying to blow on trumpet like you think it was good to play the game now. Imagine if there was another one now after this COVID and how much people would be addicted to the TV show, sitting in the house looking and you get a clever girl that goes and plays the game. She's straight away a millionaire. Like it's as simple as that. Well, this is it. I think uh, uh, I can't remember if it was at the time that you were on or the year afterwards, but there was a like Oxford report or something that basically said more people want to go on Love Island or there was more applications to Love Island than like Cambridge and Oxford combined or something, yeah. which is like a reflection because at the end of the day it's like a financial financial motive in this world. Do you know what I mean? So you got to have money and you, you, as you said, you become an almost an instant millionaire if you're remotely sensible. Look um, at the way people are nowadays as well, though. Like everyone wants to be Instagram famous. Like I'm, it's a bit rich coming from me sitting here with a million followers. But <laughs> I honestly, in my Instagram account is literally a business for me at this point. I put the odd thing on of things to do with my life and things to do with my family. But like now, I don't know if it's because I'm getting older, but I'd rather keep certain things private and keep my, like definitely I'd put struggles on relationships and stuff before. I'd rather keep my stuff separate and. That is a way for me to connect with people and benefit people for my fitness stuff. It's a way for me to connect with brands and try and publish clothes that I like and I want to wear. And if I can get paid for that, why not? But apart from that, like everyone, like people honestly stress so much. And like there's girls that I know who are just local girls, have a good job that don't need an Instagram account, but like they are happy when they get likes on photos and stuff like that. And that's cool. That is cool. Like I have nothing against that. You want to do that? absolutely smash the life out of it but like it has its pros it has its cons we all know social media now it's a tricky old thing and there's some clever people behind it but everyone wants to be instagram famous so i'm not surprised the love island applicants because it's an easy way to the top i knew that when i went on yeah exactly and and sort of talking about like the followers as as you've just sort of like sort of mentioned there um when you went in you had like 10 to 15 10 to fifteen thousand followers yeah yeah, I think before I went on, I was like just under fifteen. I think the pain is. And then there's a there's a 
again a funny story um i think i know too many funny stories obviously i've known you for so long but there are a lot of them uh so you get taken off the villa but as the island show is recorded 24 hours in advance or whatever you're in like uh, a little holding a little area holding villa so yeah holding villa it's like a villa it's not as nice as the big villa it's not as nice as the villa that's on tv but it's still bloody nice um <laughs> And you go there either by yourself if you're kicked out by yourself or in my situation, I was kicked out on, I think it was five weeks, five days or something like that. And it was with three other people. So we all got up there. Obviously, it's the first time you're allowed to drink in six weeks plus the two weeks that you were there before. So like nearly eight weeks. So obviously where we've got bottled, we went, we're still under supervision, by the way. Uh, so I you, thought there was alcohol on the show. Yeah, there is, but it's like a girl, I think it's a glass and a half of wine or a like a mini San Miguel, you know, like the mini cans on there. Oh, okay, like okay. Two of those. So, I mean, right. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, you're not allowed to drink. <laughs> six, six for five, 220 pounds. You're not really getting pissed off. <laughs> well, actually, I am a proper lightweight. I'm a proper lightweight nowadays, but back then, I could party a little bit harder. Um, anyway, going to this villa, so they were, they were letting us have like maybe like, I think there was wine on the go or something on the go. Anyway, we had a few drinks getting pissed off security guard goes and i don't know if you smoke a cigarette or something but like you know like a window ledge in a like in a spanish villa like the big stone he left his phone unlocked on the stone and i was just like chugging away and i was like shit i'm gonna like i saw his phone lights still on so i just like got his phone and i like searched my name on instagram and like the instagram following was like on five hundred and sixty thousand followers and i was like what the hell and then i shouted at like i think it was alex Ellie and Daryl, the, the people that came out with me, and I was like, should I check your accounts? And like, they were on like maybe 80K, 100K, something like that. And then obviously, when the show goes live, then you're allowed your phone back because obviously they don't want to give away the news of who's out when the show is filmed 24 hours or however many hours in advance. So then obviously, got my phone the next day and it was like on another. 250k plus so it was like on 750,000 followers and I was just like this is nuts how quickly it's grown and then you you got up to I think it was 1.1 1.2 mil yeah it was like at its highest like 1.25 mil and then obviously you lose you lose a bunch when you come off the show yeah because they're, they're probably Love Island fans and then well, you Love Island fans, aren't they? they don't really care about me doing handstand push-ups as, and <laughs> I, I get that but like at least <laughs> at least the majority they do you know what it is? Like, I love the people that follow me because, like, I get as much as, like, yeah, there's trolling and there's negatives, but I've had loads of positives and loads of people I've met who are good relationships out of there. Some of the situations and the freebies that I've got are amazing and, like, things that I buzz off when I was a kid. Like, I mean, Reebok partnership every now and then and stuff like that. Stuff that I would have buzzed off before the show. Now I can actually, like, I'm an individual that can get that, you know? Social media, I wouldn't have had that without that. And... The, the thing, like, obviously, with that massive rise, you, you've basically got a million followers in a time where you weren't even allowed to check your phone. So you went into this thing relatively unknown. Obviously, people in Newcastle sort of know of you, but relatively unknown on a grander scale. And you come out and you're all over the place. And mainly for a bad reason as well, because you were the bad boy, as we've already spoken about. Yeah. Um, how, like, obviously, the show has got a a really bad history with mental health and things like that. How does that sort of, all them eyes on you all straight away, how does that affect you? It's a funny one, you know, I think that like, I do think they had me set out to be that character because I think that interviewed me and knew that I would be able to take it. I actually do. I don't think like, it's not staged, it's not scripted, it's nothing like that. But I do think they significantly picked me to put in as that last boy because they knew what was going to happen. Um, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less, but I know, like, I, could, I honestly couldn't. Like, it's going to take way more to put me down and stuff like that, like trolling and stuff like that. But I will tell you that I've been in relationships with people and I've had friends who are in the industry that it has had way more of a negative impact on than me. Like, I've seen it firsthand behind closed doors, like, loads of times. Like, people don't understand, like, the impact. Like, people think, oh, that person's got 10 million followers, right? I don't care who it is, right? 
even the likes of like your Ariana Grande is not that are worth like 150 mil followers, they for the crack now and then will have a look down their comments, right? And sometimes when it's like when you're the person in the limelight that's done something bad or something that's not like what's frowned upon, that's not the best, like they will look and they will look. And you always remember like the bad ones, you don't necessarily remember the good ones because they stand out more. People who are people who are positive or people who like you, who actually are genuinely a fan comment once they get a nice reply they're done they'll be like oh remember that time when they comment people who are bad mouth and you comment every single day relentlessly yeah and like like i say like i'm quite thick skinned like i could not honestly give a monkeys about like what people say like i will still be doing my thing and i'll still be doing my thing next year but for other people how it affects them i think people really need to like check themselves if they are the people that are commenting out there because uh, everybody see like people do read the comments and people it it affects people much more especially when it's about appearance or about like i don't know the way someone looks whether it be like weight or something like that imagine like getting picked on in school and like times are by a million like it's like, like that well exactly i think it goes back to the beginning of our conversation of them comments can either drive you forward or have a negative impact but it everyone is going to react to them comments differently fortunately early on it got you into the gym and fortunately since it's not really affected you too much the other thing that i sort of want to add on top of that is the people the people around the person who might be in the limelight should also try to not overdo it but like just make sure that they know that you're there check up on them and and yeah. and sort of just like me and you talk about this a lot and I always ask it and you always say you're fine, but I still always ask it just in case. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I know that it doesn't affect you in that way, but just on the off day that one, on an off chance that one day you might be feeling and something ever negative was to happen. Obviously I'd feel like a dick. Do you know what I mean? If you didn't ask. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally like other things. I'm not going to lie. Like other things will affect me and I'm not giving up like, Oh, alpha, blah, blah, blah. Like nothing affects me. hundred percent things affect me. It just so happens that people, like I think of things quite rationally, people who I don't know on social media doesn't, it's more people who are in my personal life. So like you, you asking stuff like that, like I would speak out if it was something that actually affected me, but it just so happens that social media doesn't, but I can totally understand why people in my shoes where you've been portrayed as the bad boy, you've been tr- portrayed as the alpha male of the show, whatever you want to say. I say it like this because I cringe when I say it. <laughs> but like, if you've been portrayed that much to be that bad person, then how do you then feel confident enough to like be like, I'm upset about this because you're supposed to be the bad rough one. Are you supposed yeah. to, do you know what I mean? So like that Mike who like passed away um, before the year before me, he didn't pass away. He was on the show the year before me, but then obviously passed away at Christmas time-ish. Anyway, um, like he had the same reputation, like bad boy, like, like almost that stereotype is like, oh, nothing's going to affect him. He's hard as nails. He just cares about getting girls and then sacking them off and stuff like that. Like if you get painted with that brush so many times, then how is that person, if they are struggling, meant to speak out? Because they've been trolled so much for being that. So like, I can understand why he probably didn't. Um, But it is super important to do that. Super, yeah. super important. It's, it's really important. And the show doesn't o- only just have a, a, a mental effect, but also has a physical effect as well. Um, so when you came out, you, you had your tour that you had to do, which is going to all these clubs all the time. And obviously you're doing um, all these PAs, public appearances. You've got your own little car that just gets you from one destination to another, which might sound like a really, a really cool thing from the outside. But you realise that you were having very little sleep. And then one day you go for a run and it feels a bit off when you go to the doctors and they say? I had pneumonia. Yeah, he had pneumonia, which is yeah. nuts. It's a, it's a bit nuts when you come out. Every, like, everyone, that, everyone that's done a good amount of time on the show will know like you're going from like TV show, like talk show, to radio, to podcast. To, like, in, in my shoes, like quite a lot of the boys that are quite influential do peers and like me sam like jack wears like off my yeah like absolutely smashed them but like you're running off like a couple hours sleep every single night you're eating crap at service stations you're like sleeping in cars and like going from sometimes two nightclubs a night like it's daft what it does physically and i could have turned it down i could have turned it down obviously but being the business 
minded individual that I am, why on earth would you turn? You will never get that money again in your life. And like, you should make the most of it. So obviously I made the most of it. I just said yes to everything, which was a little bit more intense than I realized. Like obviously the novelty wears off. You're like a rock star that can't sing at the start. <laughs> like you, you're going around, you're going all these club appearances, but you can't even DJ, or at least I couldn't. I like I'm just going there for photos to meet random people, which is nuts. You, the thrill of it drives you at the start, but once it starts wearing off, like it is hard on you physically. So ended up like being drained like massively and then run down, put on a drip, <laughs> and then uh, ended up, yeah, ended up getting like some sort of mild pneumonia. Which is crazy because you don't you, you see the TV show as many of us do, but you don't really fight like see the the behind the scenes essentially. Like yeah. you don't think of these things when when the when you see like people are going on public appearances, you think, oh well, I'll do that. It seems like a piece of piss. You know what I mean? Turn up to a yeah. club and taking a few photos. Oh, it's easy. Yeah, yeah. And then you realize that you're doing sometimes a few clubs in the same night. I'm pretty sure you had like a club in Spain and in England in the same night, which I don't even fathom how that's possible. Yeah, no, we did a, I remember like we did twice, we did a pool party in Spain, in Marbella or Mallorca, I think it was Mallorca, um, did a pool party at three o'clock and got in at Peterborough by 11 to do a nightclub. Like Which it was, is, yeah. you know, it's like getting flown to like back in England to do a nightclub on the same day and like having to like rev yourself up because you like speaking to people a lot, you know, like, and you're trying to make comments. It's, you know, what it's like when you hype someone up for an interview, almost like an interview, like, you psych yourself up, podcast, you psych yourself yeah. up to like speak to someone. There's like hundreds of people who are waiting for you and you like rattling it off one after one after one. And then you're trying to go and do the next thing. It's a, uh, yeah, it's not for everyone. Definitely not. Yeah, exactly. Because you need to give everyone the same amount of attention because they're, yeah. they're waiting for you. Do you know what I mean? And if, even if you're having a bit of an off day, like that entire line of people are probably going to be like, that's their perception of you now. Yeah. Um, how, how do you feel like your perception, uh, the per- do you feel like public perception of you has changed since the island? Because you have became more focused back in into the fitness and back into the gym and things. And you have sort of promoted um, healthy living, but in a very sort of no BS way, like a very science-based fitness way. Yeah. Sort of. So do you think, think that it, like changed? The, the main thing that the main thing that's probably changed now is like people are thinking like god he's still preaching the same things that he did the day when he came out the villa like he's not selling anything because like everyone brings out a fitness plan and everyone does some juice shit something like that like i never did that like i promoted my fitness brand but like real real programs real food and real results and um I'm still saying the same things that I did the day I came out of the villa. I never saw anyone any bullshit when it came to fitness, whether it be training or nutrition. Um, and I think it speaks wonders now because all the ones that did are now not doing it. They're doing something else now or they're doing like a different venture or something like that. I'm still Adam who does the fitness. Like there's no one on my year that was more gym oriented than me. There was no one that was more training and nutrition oriented. And I'm pretty sure the only person seriously who still does fitness on my year is Frankie. And like we have a respect for each other, but apart from that, like I wouldn't really say anyone's qualified that much or clued up about it. Yeah, uh, so everyone did go down the different paths, but you stuck stuck loyal to yours, yeah. People people see through it because I think they see the loyalty. And like, yes, I've lost like maybe two hundred thousand followers, but I feel like the in the relationship that I have with the followers now, like probably I've gained more followers that are actually interested in me doing fitness, whereas. I've lost a couple of hundred thousand followers that are were just interested in who I was going out with at the time and like what I was doing and what sort of crap holiday I was going on or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I think it's not just promoting something that is BS, but also calling it out as well. Because on numerous occasions you do, um, and this is probably to the detriment to you and that the relationship with the person who's promoting it because sometimes i've seen you like posts like uh when people have got the ab stimulating things or when people have got the juice shakes and all this stuff and you just yeah. post like another social media influencer and just call them out straight away like this is bs yeah like i try there's there's people who are better at than me that don't have the really like i've been in a situation before where like it's been one of a kid that I quite like and his girlfriend's promoted something that's fucking bollocks. Like it's actually harmful to an individual. Like 
like people having those juices that are like aloe vera gel, people having boom board, absolute shite. Like those ab stimulators, like ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like put five Nokias on your stomach and get someone to ring you, like <laughs> the same thing. Like, do you know what I mean? Anyway, like people doing that, it really, really winds me up because it's the one thing that I'm passionate about is like giving people, re- like people get really down about the weight. People have really bad relationships with food. Don't give them a reason to do make it even worse because they'll probably just be scared of the gym forever because they'll never get results. So they'll be scared of like trying to eat properly because they just think it's like the next fad. So yeah, I've called a few people out. I'm not as brutal as some people. Some people are way worse and I'd fair play to them. Like they should do that. But maybe as I've came out of the bubble a, a little bit more now as well, I'd probably start doing that a little bit more. Yeah, 100%. So it's just one thing that really gets under my skin. Yeah, I know, like, um, again, we've had con- countless conversations about stuff like that before, because as, uh, as w- when you are when you are like a bigger kid, like you were, and I was, when uh, getting into it, you do try everything because yeah. you're uneducated. But then when you educate yourself more and more, and luckily you had a bit of a head start uh, when we started going to the gym and you already were, like, educating yourself. So luckily yeah. I fell into the right circle of me and you talking uh like fact-based training but yeah. it's very easy um to to fall like the other way as well yeah there's some shock and stuff out there but there's some really good people pushing proper training and nutrition as well uh, but a, a thing that you get quite often from um when people are asking you q and a's and and things is you don't stick to one training method you're a bit of a you have everything at one so you you do your bodybuilding you do your powerlifting olympic cross training x y and z you name it you've tried it why why do you do all of this and do you incorporate it into your fitness plans for people to purchase it's what it's one of the things like if you do bench press to a clock are you doing crossfit are you doing bodybuilding yeah do you know what i mean like if you do if you do like i don't know like you do thrusters but you do five sets of one rep maxes like are you powerlifting are you doing crossfit like where like how far does the line go they're all the same you're all training but like you should pull things from every in my personal opinion you should pull things and learn things from every different aspect there are amazing athletes and amazing individuals in each one that that has developed the methods that have like created these forms of training like bodybuilders could improve from doing more things the crossfitters do and crossfitters could improve from doing more things that bodybuilders do 110 percent now and not even that like both of those could improve from doing yoga more from doing stretching and mobility more like i hate yoga like i kind of like i don't hear it's not my jam like it's just stretching with some raj music to be clear <laughs> like it, it just is that but what could like you shouldn't really be naive and like segregate it again, like segregating things out. There are you've got to find what someone needs. So if someone like comes to me as a client and they prefer bodybuilding type of training, right? That's cool. I'll give you that type of training because I'm educated about it and I know it. If someone's coming to me and they have a CrossFit more performance based goal, I might move the needle in that direction ever so slightly, but still pull things from the other one. So what I like to I'm a bit of a jack of all trades in the sense of I have all those avenues of training behind in my arsenal and I want to use them for the best of the ability to the client, not for me. Like I can quite happily take my personal needs out of it. Like I can guarantee that like one of, I would quite like to do an Ironman. Now, will I look skinnier from doing six months of training like that compared to what I did in my bodybuilding days? Like, absolutely. But like, that's my goal. But do I still have the education and know what that person who wants to do a bodybuilding program wants to do? Absolutely. Like, I've not lost that knowledge, but like, I would probably have clients at that point that they might even be stronger than me in that aspect because I'm doing an Ironman program for six months because that's where I go. But as soon as I come out of that, I might go back to that. So what I'm trying to say is like, I've developed like, almost a big bundle of knowledge where like I try and develop the programs that are best for the, uh, for the individual's goal, fitness levels and current circumstances. And a prime example of that is kit. What do people have in lockdown right now? You have a kettlebell, you don't have barbells. I have a barbell. I don't have that many kettlebells. Like, well, I've got, I've got a full gym, but anyway, <laughs> other people have got other stuff. So trying to take my personal opinion, a personal approach, 
I don't personally like training that much with kettlebells, but I guarantee I could smash someone and give someone a very good controlled workout, either side of the scale, whichever one they need to do with a kettlebell. And I can attest to this because I have a kettlebell at home and at the beginning of the first lockdown, um, we sort of worked on some uh, some few exercises and things and they work out amazing. And yeah. not just to that, but also over the years, I feel like my training has sort of become a very more well-rounded because when you're doing something and we come down to train at the gym, uh, well, when I come down to the train at the gym, we end up just doing what you're training at the time. So when you go through <laughs> your CrossFit phase, I learn about CrossFit. When you go through your kettlebell phase, I start learning about kettlebells um, and so on and so forth. But it does work. Like a lot of the things, again, I, you take what works for you because um, obviously I'm not teaching it to other people. So I don't need the education that much for like other people. But for me, the finishers, CrossFit finishers, I'll, I'll whack them onto the end of a bodybuilding um, sort of training session like yeah. uh, now because it's it still it increases your fitness and um just overall it is a bit more healthy do you know what I mean like uh, at the end of the year I'm trying to just go for as much energy from the workout as possible yeah. and if I can get a good pump which is the egotistical sort of side of me but also get like the good hard sort of cardio in in a short amount of space which is basically CrossFit it's best of both worlds yeah, like if someone has a specific goal, I will give them that thing. But I do honestly believe now after trying all of the different sort of forms of training that there is, I, I do honestly believe I have the perfect combination for the general lean athletic individual that wants to stay fit and healthy. I think I've got the ultimate combination and we'll have that in programs right now, like trying them all. Every single session that we almost have almost has a little bit of a strength training, a little bit of accessory slash bodybuilding work and some conditioning CrossFit style. Like we've got a hybrid program now. And I honestly believe it's the ultimate way to train because you don't just look the part and you like, you have been a prime example of this, of like doing the bro split, like training for the way you look but you couldn't do anything more than walk on a treadmill. Now you can do 5Ks. You asked yeah. us the other day, you were like, what's a respectable 5K time on WhatsApp? Like, it's the same as me. I looked like, at one point I looked like, and you could put us on the front of a magazine. I couldn't do any more than an incline walk without passing out. Like, that's not healthy in my eyes. So like, do I think I've found like a happy medium and more than a happy medium? Because I think that I would like to think that I'm fairly fit. Yeah, absolutely. And I can also, and this is the best part of it, teach people how to break it down for them coming into it. Like how, when people ask is how can I try and like, people see me all the time do muscle ups on rings. How can I do something that feels a bit like that? But for my fitness level, I feel like I'm pretty confident that I can teach something the most relatable aspect or the most relatable scaled version for them. Okay, me doing handstand pushups, you doing pushups with like the dumbbells either side. So it's just increasing the range of motion or like pipe pushups or something like that. Which I think uh, is basically the general population. When you say, when you when you say it like that, is most people don't want to be on the front cover of a magazine. Yeah, most people don't want to lift the strongest amount of weight. They just want to feel good. You yeah. know what I mean? They want to be as efficient as possible in their actual job. Yeah. Um, which is more and more over the years. That's how I have started uh, approaching it. Because obviously, at the beginning, as we we would talking like we've talked about so much is uh, losing weight first and then starting to look good but then it goes on to performance um the last sort of topic that you sort of touched on there was covid and mm. obviously this whole pandemic has really thrown a spanner in the works for the fitness industry but also for yourself because because you had it for a bit so what was that like and then to piggyback on that what was how has it been for the gym as well uh, from the gym, it's been severely annoying because I feel like, and I'm not going to go too far into this, the benefits like don't outweigh the risks for me. Like, you, I'm sure anyone with an Instagram account has seen the memes of like, you know, like obesity levels kill people more. It also increases the chances of COVID. Like heart disease kills people more. It also like, you know, the things like the benefits don't outweigh the risks for me anymore. Um, it's affected the gym massively. And do you know what? Like, I don't even, I do care about the money and the financial aspect of the gym to a certain extent, but I also like really care about the members. Money is just a way of keeping score almost. As yeah. it sounds, it is like, it's a way of doing that. Like I live a quite a comfortable life now, but 
having members that are like, the gym is a safe haven for a lot of things. You don't know what's going on at home. Like me, like when my parents were splitting up, like the gym was like a safe haven. You don't know what's happening in people's lives. You don't know what negative things are happening. And the gym is like a little bit of a sanctuary for it. So that's what's more annoying because I speak to people a lot and every single person over this pandemic has texted me being like, oh, I'm so like annoyed. Like I could love to blow off some steam in the gym and it's just not open. So mm. that's like one of the most annoying things. Um, what else was saying from a business perspective? Yeah, so uh, just, to, just to sort of expand on that as well, it, that this is like the busiest time of the year for you as well at the beginning of the year. Uh, well in the gym industry so and obviously we've just went back into a national lockdown here so that's that's a added sort of like it's kicking a person what they're down essentially yeah it's just it just keeps on going it doesn't it like the it's super annoying it's annoying for everyone and i think everybody's struggling right now we're just trying to we're just trying to do our best in this situation and like that's what i would say everyone i would say everyone if i've got a little bit of advice like if you can do some, if find your thing, whether it be running, whether it be yoga, whether it be training, like whether it be doing one of my crazy dumbbell programs, anything like that, like just find something that gives you an outlet for like a couple of hours a day that tries to like blow off some steam because it's mental health as well as physical health. Like I'm pretty happy with the way I look right now. Sometimes I do sessions just because of, because I'm annoyed about other things that have happened during the day. And I find myself doing that all the time, especially as I'm getting older and things with business, like, it is like therapy for me. So my advice to people for that, from that point of view, individually wise, would just be to do something to make yourself feel good. Um, and the other the other side of things that I was asking before was um, your experience with COVID because um, you had it uh, maybe like six, seven months ago now, actually. Yeah, I mean, I had had COVID pretty much when it was pretty new, new Newcastle. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure our numbers were like, 18 per 100,000 or something like that. And then I was sitting in a house, me and my girlfriend both had it. Um, yeah, like I, I didn't really think it was that bad, but like, I don't want to sound... You can only speak... Yeah, I can only speak from my point of view. For me, it was like a bad strain of tonsillitis, if not even just like a regular strain of tonsillitis. It was two big days where I felt pretty bad. And then after that, that was it it was done and it was gone but the most worrying thing was like for the first week to 10 days when i tested positive i easily could have pushed and went to work i went to work with worse headaches with worse illnesses like with worse colds or flus like i've easily pushed myself to go to work so that's the worrying thing so if it is as contagious as what to say i would have easily not noticed i almost went for the test as a little bit of a joke of someone making a remark being like ah oh, you're ill you haven't got covid have you one of them so it again make sure you're safe and you get tested and try and wear your, I'm actually asthma, asthmatic and I still try and wear my mask a little bit more than the average Joe because I'm pretty fit where I think a mask is not really going to give me an asthma attack. I think people are pretty stubborn. Yeah. But wear a fucking mask, do you know what I mean? Like it's not for you, it's for other people. And hopefully we can just get back to normal as quick as possible. Again, yeah. you can only speak anecdotally and you are a fit individual, but for someone who might have underlying health conditions, etc., it could be a lot worse. Um, we're going to wrap up with quick fire questions. So it's the same five questions as pretty much every podcast now. First one being, what are you most proud of? What I'm most proud of? Um just constantly improving every year constantly do you know what i mean like i have a, I have a very good life i have yeah i have a good life and i'm only trying to get better i think when you don't do that then that is that's being unsuccessful you know just trying to get better i'm nowhere near what i want to be but at least i'm trying to get there as soon as you stop trying to get there that's when you're not successful pretty much answered all five questions with that one but uh, number two is what you're most looking forward to um at the minute like speaking like this just being bloody normal and going out being able to see everyone and do normal things and not taking the little things for granted probably probably friends that i sack off a lot of times because i was a little bit too tired but i probably could have pushed myself to just go for a coffee or go you know what i mean like the little things um get myself on a holiday have a normal functioning gym and business and then make that make that 10 times better what is your biggest motivation um, 
I don't know, trying to help people as much as possible. I know it sounds cringy and cliche, but like I do actually like, I feel like I care a little bit more about like the clients and stuff. Like the every single person on the academy, I re, I, I have a habit of working too much and like getting too emotionally involved into people. That's and then that's what I mean. It's my it's probably one of my worst problems. Like people message on the app and I almost check in on them too much and pester them because I'm like emotionally of being like, I want you to do well. Come on, like what's happening? <laughs> Um, which is probably a good trait to have, but so trying to trying to hit as many individuals as I can with my views and ethos on training and nutrition. Number four is what is your definition of success? <sighs> trying to get better physically, mentally, financially, every single year. Just trying to get better, even if you're not, even if it's not working, but still trying. Don't roll over. And last but not least, because it's the Culture Cast podcast, how has your culture affected you thus far? What is my culture? My culture, I've got a great, positive, healthy family that push me on harder every day. And I try to remove negative energy, negative people, negative, negative aspects of my life and surround myself with as many people, the right people to make me better, to make me more successful. That's it. That's perfect. Um, again, thank you for your time. Um, anything you want to plug or all of your links will be in the description, X, Y, Z, but you'll have way more following than me. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. And then if you want to jump on with some fitness training plans, anything like that, just check out adamcollard.com, adamcollardfitness.com. I'm pretty sure it takes you to the same website, but we've just got two domains. Um, and then we can help you with absolutely anything even if it's mental as much as it is physical, jump on it and give you something. And then if you want to see some ballsy, crazy stuff in the gym, at Adam Collard. Yeah. Perfect. That's perfect.